What happened to Zoo Lily? Once valued at 2.6 billion in 2013, just declared bankruptcy. They pushed a lot of emphasis, pushed a lot of their marketing through the email. There was a constant bombardment, Dave, that led to spam fatigue and customer annoyance. They did a lot of flash sales, which led an erosion of that thrill factor. You know, imagine a prime day every day where you're having all your vendors lower their prices eventually doesn't really become an exciting thing. The comeback of retail. I've done some shopping recently. Was blown away that it was hard to find parking. There were lines. There was a buzz in the air. Going into a store, touching something, holding it, buying it. You leave with it. That's that satisfaction all immediate all together. Immediate gratification. Immediate. I'm impressed. Consumers still are attracted to retail stores. <laughs> Listening to. Welcome to What the Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Dave, you know, I saw that Zoo Lily, I don't know how much shopping you do on Zoo Lily, but I saw that Zoo Lily, once valued at 2.6 billion in 2013, just declared bankruptcy or went bankrupt. What happened to all the money? What? So tell us. So I, I know a little bit about Zulily. It's, Is that where uh, you get your fashion wear? You get your fashion and clothes from Zulily, don't you? Oh, no. I, you know what? I'm a little, I am not a fashionista. Buying clothing online for myself, not something I'm super comfortable with doing. You know, I like to go, I like to try things on. There's been too many times where I've even just purchased something from a store, but something that I didn't try on nine times out of 10, I find myself returning it. Oh, my. but you know, that's what a lot of people, when they shop, they, they buy, you know, I, I don't do too much online clothing shopping period, but when I do, I do get three or four items because like for shoes, they don't always fit great. Sometimes the, especially for me, pants don't always fit great. So I always get a couple just because I know I may have to return some. But I'm sure some of this change and shift in consumer preferences, you know, talking to other people that are in the industry, talking about how customer preferences have changed since 2020. And as we were looking into this and looking at the research, it surprised me, Dave. I'm sure it may have surprised you too that the retailers, the physical retailers themselves have, in some cases, doubled their profits since right. 2020. You would think, maybe not. Maybe they're barely surviving, but it's not the case. Their net profits, in some cases, as we're going to highlight today, doubled. I find that amazing. Sure. Maybe they're like, maybe more people like you, they don't want to shop online as much. Maybe they want to go into the store and try their pants and shirts and whatnot. I, if I'm ordering something online, my expectation has only grown over time. If I, if I was getting it in two days in the past, now I want it in one day. If I was able to return something within 30 days, now I want 60 days to return it. I want you know it to be easier. I want a better experience. And frankly, the, the online shopping experience from ordering, getting it delivered, it's my experience hasn't been super great, you know, over the past six months or so. It's gotten a little worse. Oh, my goodness. Well, things are about to get hairy because I don't know if you're following, Dave, what's happening in the shipping industry. But anything coming out of the Middle East that was going through the Suez Canal, it's going to be delayed by at least three weeks, three hmm. to four weeks. Because now they got to go all the way around Africa to come out of there and deliver goods into Europe and, and the rest of the world, yeah, the rest of the Western that. world. So if you're waiting for your... Your Persian sombrero. Well, they don't have sombreros there. What do they have over there? <laughs> Whatever goods, dates. You're, you like your your dates. I love dates. You know, a lot of them come from that part of the world. I'm going to be waiting a little longer. Hopefully they don't, you know, go bad in the meantime. But when we're talking about online shopping, you know, that's kind of in our wheelhouse. We've been, we've been uh, on, selling on Amazon for a long time. And we've seen some of those customer demands shift uh, from 2020, 2021, 23. 24 now where we're in a i don't want to say new era because it's not really new it's new and that it's different but the sh a shift has definitely occurred we're going to highlight some retailers who have doubled their profits since 2020 as well as one really big one we just talked about zulily which is on the decline well more than decline they're out of business basically and others Etsy is reporting lower profits as well. So there are some huge shifts happening in the entire economy, in the marketplace, in the online landscape. 
that businesses should be paying attention to. Yeah, for sure. And with the increase with some of the retailers, the physical retail outlets, you know, that we've researched for this, I think it's very eye-opening. Consumers are not afraid to walk into a store. They want to. Right. They, they not, not, not only not afraid, but they're doing it. Uh, yeah. They are doing it. And they're so still spending. You'll be, yeah. And before we jump into the research that we uncovered for this episode, I want to give some big props. Big props to James Orsini, a.k.a. Jimmy the Pencil, who stopped by the podcast uh, earlier uh, on, the, on another episode. You know, he was, if you don't know about James Orsini, let me just tell you two seconds, maybe 10 seconds about him. He was handpicked by Gary Vaynerchuk, a.k.a. Gary V to head up his organization within a certain group. He's, a, he's right now uh, heading up the Sasha group. I understand he may have some news in, in the coming future with regard to uh, what he's, his role there is. So I'll wait for him to break that news. But Jimmy the Pencil, you know, reminds me a little bit about, I told him, uh, you remind me a lot of Al Pacini. And I put a vote, I put my vote in right now for when they do the reboot, He's the lead actor for the role of the new Michael Corleone, James Orsini. You get big props today. And you know, Dave, I can't wait till he comes back a second time because he's got a lot going on. And I know that when he was handpicked by Gary V, the biggest reason he, he told us he wanted to avoid the big business mistakes that come with businesses that have been in business for 26, 30 or more years. And he was at the helm, him, James, at a lot of other organizations that were large, other media companies, ad agencies. And he wants to avoid the traps and mistakes that those right. agencies made. Well, hey, in respect to avoiding traps and mistakes, the Harvard Business Review study reveals a sobering fact. Did you know that employees can switch between 20 22 different apps nearly 1,200 times daily. That's context switching. You know, that mental juggling, it takes a toll. It increases stress. It slows productivity. It completely undermines focus. Now, picture an organization that's tethered to outdated systems, the stress of budget cuts, shifting customer preferences, right? So in an uncertain and rapidly changing economy, you want a partner like Global Tech Worldwide with over two decades of business communications expertise to seamlessly integrate diverse tools for your workplace. A failure to update technology, it's not just a risk. It is a threat to your company's survival. So Global Tech Worldwide not only offers a solution, but Global Tech offers a lifeline inviting businesses to navigate the uncertainty of rapidly changing technology. Book an appointment at globaltech.com. That's global-tech.com to get started today. Thank you, Dave. Terrific. So we were just talking about online e-commerce and talking about the changing preferences. I just want to ask the question, what happened to Zoo Lily, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to him, you know? I mean, what, what's, it, happen what's happening in the online e-commerce space today? Because we're in a new place than we were in March of 2020. We've had invoking James Orsini. He said, you know, companies can swell and companies can grow organically. And he had a front row seat. You know, he worked as, a, as an analyst. I think I recall as an analyst for Goldman Sachs, the financial analyst. And so he had a front row seat to numbers, to IPOs and all the rest. And he told us, he says, you know, you want to grow? You can grow, but you can swell or you can grow organically, which you can sustain. And I would imagine that a lot of companies during COVID, some of them shrunk because their industries got hurt and some of them just grew, especially if you were anything online and you could ship it out tomorrow or the following day. And, and you know, my question to James, it had to do with, you know, what are the dangers of, what's the danger of a swell, a swelling business versus a growing business? And we've seen this in the communications industry, right? So. During, during the pandemic, people needed solutions. They needed communication solutions. They needed platforms. So we saw some public organizations just go through the roof within a very short period of time. And when that happened, they had, they had to hire. They were on a hiring 
move. It's like we can need as many people as we can. And I think of organizations like Zoom. Zoom, that they became a household name in such a short period of the time. I didn't follow their stock price. And I, I, I feel like I, I should have spent more time analyzing that. But obviously, the business is growing, customer demand, customer expectations. And then once the pandemic kind of moved along and people started going back to the office and people were using different platforms than just Zoom, the, the need for all these employees was no longer there. You know, so they went through kind of a, a budgetary, I don't want to call it necessarily a crisis, but we had a lot of contacts that were with Zoom one day and no longer with them <laughs> the, the following Gone the day. next. Um, that, and that's kind of the, like what you're saying, riding that wave. And so we, like you said, Dave, riding that wave and going back and understanding how did this all go down? You know, are, are there some, some things that are happening? Cause Zoo Lily's not in the same boat. I mean, the, you t Zoo Lily, Etsy, and I want to say there's an, another online retailer, Jane.com. Forgive me if I botched that one, but I know there was another one floating around that was uh, contemplating uh, bankruptcy as well. When those kinds of things happen, those are signals that there are shifts because, you know, overnight uh, things can change. And that happened at the beginning of the pandemic. And I wouldn't say overnight things have changed since the pandemic because it's not overnight. It's just been a rolling thing like work from home, hybrid work. All of these things have contributed. Um, but in this case study, when we're looking at Zoo Lily, there were some factors that led up to where where they are now, which is essentially bankrupt. So Dave, if we look back, um, I'm gonna look at my notes because there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we, um, if we're looking at a timeline. It turns out that Zoo Lily's marketing was predicated heavily on email marketing, which is interesting because, you know, uh, we, I heard a video where Gra Gary V talked about back in the day, early 2000s, Zulily was re, uh, or he, I should say, instead of Zulily, he did a ton of email marketing and the open rates were through the roof at like 70, 80%. That's not the case today. So if you're relying heavily on email marketing and we're showing a video here, if you're, if you're, listening to us on the audio platform, we have a video of Zulily playing on the video side. Um, they're really catering to the, to the market, female market, um, the, the twenties, the 30 year olds, uh, in that demographic, that's also budget conscious. And that demographic has changed. And we're going to talk about that later on as, as we jump into the, uh, retailers that are succeeding in this current environment. But given that they pushed, pushed a lot of emphasis and pushed a lot of their marketing through the email. There was a constant bombardment, Dave, that led to spam fatigue and customer annoyance, which, which, <laughs> which is interesting. I, I don't know about you, but I get tons of spam every single day. I hear that Google's doing some major things that they're planning on doing to cut down on the spam. Um, but we're, we're going to wait and see here in 2024 how that all plays out. One other thing that came up that was interesting was that they did a lot of flash sales. So constant flash sales, uh, which led to uh, an erosion of that thrill factor. You know, think about what Amazon does with Prime yep. and Amazon Prime Days. There used to be one. Now there's two, usually one in July. Sometimes uh, they they throw one uh, in Q4 as well, and so imagine yeah, a Prime Day every day, or something of that sort, where you're having you know very all your all your vendors uh, lower their prices. Eventually, it doesn't really become an exciting thing. Eventually, right. it's not really a sale. It's not really a deal per se. And I know when I worked in the consumer package industry, that was also the case. You run the risk if you're constantly quote having a sale then it's never a sale there's never really a deal because the consumer starts becoming used to the fact that what was a deal a special deal it no longer becomes special in the mind of the consumer <clears throat> that's one of the things i i really hate when i'm shopping for something online or even doing some research online and i haven't just seen it with physical goods 
I, I get spam. I get email marketed every single day. And sometimes it's one company and the messaging is always, you know, it's 50% off. It's 60% off. It's always a buy one, get one, which is 60% off. Like it's always this, the, the exact same offer. And I say to myself, do they think that I'm so stupid that I have to jump on this? You know, I'm looking, um, we have a gym. We have a new gym that just went up about five miles away from my house. Five days ago, I went on their website. I was just curious, are they offering anything for, you know, end of year, be beginning of 2024? And they did. They had a special, and that special ends today. This was five days ago. I went on their website last night, and it's giving me the same thing. It's like the special ends at midnight tonight, and it's the same offer that I was looking at five days ago. So I'm thinking to myself, what's my hurry? Don't trick me. Don't trick me into um, the, the, your call to action. You know, the marketing people out there, it's always this call to action. Put a, t put a timer up. That's the worst one, Rolando. The timer. There was a bit. Oh, backwards. yeah. 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 A lot of uh, websites have gone to timer. Uh, some of the travel websites have been very notorious for doing that. And there was a video that was circulating on the internet recently uh, when Black Friday happened. Uh, I believe it was Target. This 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 woman was with her camera going around taking um so at the stands and in, in the kiosks that where they have these deals like you know this big pallet of of paper and and socks or whatever the heck it was they had the callouts the price callouts right that sit above you know these kiosks and on it it said Black Friday sale. And then the lady took off the, there it is. That's the one is. So, so if, if you can watch this on the video or you are spot on today, you get a clap Ori. look at this black Friday. So pause that Ori. If we go back and when, when she's taking the, the price out, the, the, yeah, what right there, look at this, <laughs> look at this. And she found this throughout the store, Dave. So. So this is the physical version, the physical manifestation of what you were just talking about. Right. Now, it's a little switcheroo. It's not, it's saying save, it's making it seem like a deal. It's not really a deal because it was the same deal that was there yesterday. And it's all you're doing is putting a new cover on it thing at Black Friday sale. And you could see if you're watching this video. So if you're not watching it, it's a TikTok video that went viral with a lady shopping through Target and she's removing the um the prices that are on the callouts and they're the same that they were previously. There's no difference. So if you overplay your hand at this, and it seems like Target got caught here um in doing a little bit of the switcheroo, then eventually the customer is gonna find out. Information's instant today, right? Back in the day, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you could probably get away with the switcheroo. You can't today. Customers are going to share that information. And I would imagine over time, it's nothing special, Dave. It was just, like you said, the same deal it was two weeks ago. To be in one of those board meetings with those marketing geniuses, right? Bunch of Ivy Leaguers. <laughs> like, well, what's our move for Black Friday? And someone said, let's spend money. Let's spend money to look like people are getting a deal. Let's, <laughs> let's reduce, let's reduce our sales margins, increase our operational expenses all for the sake of fooling the consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot of that happening and I'm insulted. I am, I am insulted by it. Well, you're not the only one because when you look at the timeline here, so in 2015, according to what we found in 2015, uh, these flash sales started eroding for Zulily. The thrill was gone. The surprise factor is gone. And in some instances, probably, Dave, the same thing that we just saw on this video from Target was happening. A 48-hour sale on Friday. So you think, okay, I better do this before I get back to work on Monday. You go back on Monday. You go If you go back or Tuesday, you see that's a 48-hour sale again. You know, there is another retailer actually online. I won't say who they are, 
because I know who these people are. They, they sell hundreds of millions of dollars and they use this tactic for years, 48 hour sale. You go back on Friday, it says still a 48 hour sale. <laughs> you go back on Wednesday, it still says 48 hour sale. It's the so timer. they, and they said that it was timer, working. right? Yes, right there website. was a timer counting down. Um, so they, they could do that because sometimes customers don't come back every single day to their website. They know that the, the traffic you do by looking at the analytics, you know that that's not happening. But if you're trying to build customer confidence, you're trying to build uh, brand loyalty, you're trying to um, have, build a community of customers that are coming back over and over again, because that's where the money's made, Dave. Coming back, repeat customers, you can't resort uh, to these tactics forever because they're not going to work over time. So in 2015, think about 2015, Dave. So around 2015, 2016, Amazon really starts ramping up their efforts when, when you're talking about Prime. So one of the things that we saw was that Amazon around this time is ramping up their efforts, especially around the subscriptions, around Prime. And so if you look at the timeline between 2015 and, and right up until the pandemic 2020, you see that um, over time, things start happening to uh, Zulily. Um, you know, they, they do get, they get acquired in 2015 by a group called the Qualrate Group or Curate Retail Group. And when you bring in a new set of eyes, new set of management, you inevitably are going to have friction. Some people in the, the company being acquired are going to see things one way. The acquirer is going to see it another way. And so one of the things that we found was that this management um, led this new team that took over. Um, there's obviously some conflict there in the, in terms of the vision and this turmoil, you know, is never good for any organization. And as it all plays out and it's, and you move forward in time, you get a couple of other things that start popping up on the radar, Dave. And what we found was that, um, they, they started running into shipping delays and being in the online space ourselves, being sellers on the, on, on our own website and on Amazon, you know, like what you just said about customers, customers today want delivery next day. And in some cases they can get delivery same day right. with, with uh, uh, delivery and in, and in more retail stores, curbside pickup the same day. <laughs> so the expectations, the preferences of the consumer you know, who, you know who told us the same thing? James Orsini told us the same. Big props to James again. He said he was sitting uh, at, a, at the mall and he's like, you know, um, why am I sitting here waiting 20 or 30 minutes? I could I get this to deliver today by Amazon. So when you have competition, like in the way of Zula, they're competing against Amazon in some ways. And, and Amazon did ramp up their fashion, uh, their, their, um, They've ramped up their efforts to attract fashion brands to their website. And I, and I really remember that in a strong way because, you know, we get em emails all the time from Amazon every single day, as a matter of fact, and more and more started popping up on the radar when it comes to um, sellers in the fashion business, sellers that sell clothing, sellers that sell to women. They started changing their policies. Um, so and in the background, you don't always know what's going on over there. You know, and Amazon plays a very strong, a very good role here because as a competitor, they can influence the landscape in ways that others can't. And during that time frame, Dave, if we, if we move forward and you think about shipping delays, you also add inventory issues. You add the fact that, you know, these 48 hour sales or flash sales are not real sales anymore. What do you think that'll do to a, a brand when? you know, things don't arrive on time. You have inventory issues. Deals are not really deals anymore. What do you think starts happening? there? You know, people get excited about a hyped up brand. So if they make, if they've made the purchase, they're waiting for it to arrive. And then if the product is stuck because of bad delivery or there's no inventory available, if the consumer has to cancel the order, they've probably lost a lot of hope or desire, you know, for that brand. It, it market, marketing and getting that brand loyalty is in creating the excitement around a brand is so hard with all of that work and effort to then not be able 
to de- to deliver the physical goods, man, all that work for nothing. And you th- absolutely. And think about the time frame where uh, you know the pandemic hits. All the all of the um, twenty twenty hits. You have shipping, global shipping. So now you th- you throw a brand uh, Zulily, whose big focus was on clothing and 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 marketing towards females every single container ship that was out there in 2020 and 2021 was absolutely being called to the call of duty Mm -hmm. rates were through the roof companies were also going out and purchasing their own um container ships or ships to move cargo because it was what was $2,000 or $3,000 a container went up as high as $20,000 <laughs> a container. Ouch. Wait, wait a minute. I'm going to hit the wrong button. Uh, hooray, hooray for the shipping guys. They made, it, they made profit hand over fist. Retailers, if you depended on clothing, which most of it isn't made in the U.S., Dave, most of it is made all offshore. China, Vietnam. You know, Pakistan, India, where all the all the in Central America, you can't get goods fast enough during the pandemic, right? Just like you're saying. So now, things start swelling, but you run afoul. If in we ran into some of these issues, customers need this. I want this. Give me this. I need a headset. I need a phone. I need a this. I need a that because we got to send people home. Now we can't get goods, so. You go fast forward into 2022, you haven't resolved those issues. A lot of the third party sellers that are on their platform become a little bit uh, annoyed. Let's just put it that way with what's happening there. You, you start, you start a vicious cycle and then compound that with the fact that, and I want to give you the numbers here. So if you're, if you're a nerd like me and you just give me the numbers, I'm going to give you the numbers on their on their profitability just so that you could get a timeline you know the lack of profits will make a company will put a lot of stress on a company so in 2020 uh they reported a a negative margin of negative 18.9 percent net income margin and these are financial numbers that are being provided here on google and 2022 a minus 0.08 margin and uh, up to 2023 for, for the records that are available, a negative 12.73 margin compared to, compared to Amazon, Amazon in all of those years that I just mentioned, 2020, 2022 and 23 was right around two to 3% margin, 2.99 in 2020, all the way to 2.4 so far in 20. 23. So even though it was still only a few points in profitability, profitability is different than negative. You're in the negative, you're in the red, you can't survive. You cannot last. You've got to be able to make profits to survive. So all of these things compounded, Dave, which in the end, if you're not making profit, you're not going to be around for a long time. So what was interesting that you just shared was in 2020, that's when they started to ha- started to feel a kind of a drop in revenue. Uh, the in in net income. Well, I didn't look back. We didn't look back to twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen, but what we could get was from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty three, and and in those um, years, it was all negative. I don't know prior to that hmm. um, if it was positive or not. But what I do know is that their valuation peaked right after their IPO. And just kept steadily going down, um, based on on the on the information we have. So if if their stock valuation keeps going down, then you're probably going to run into some issues here uh, when it comes to profitability, because the, the the market would only hang on so long and asking where's the profits. It's interesting with Zulily being fashion. How fashion? You know, I, I'm thinking 2020 height of the pandemic. Yeah, fashion was no longer a priority, right? People were in their homes. 
All right. And, and who knew, who knew, think about 2020. Now we're jumping back to 2020 for a moment. We did not know that, um, everybody was going to be hanging out at home forever. Right. Um, or that work as we knew it. You know, I remember in March, 2020 having to cancel meetings. And I, and I remember telling a couple of our suppliers that we're going to, we're going to meet. Well, you know, I'll see you in a, I'll see you in a month. Don't worry about it. <laughs> that turned right. into many, 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 many months. Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry <laughs> about it. I'll be in a couple of weeks, you know, we'll get this under control. And that didn't happen. But here's the thing, Dave. After people started getting a taste for working at home, right now we're around 25, a quarter of the workforce that can work is working some kind of hybrid or remote work. That number is not insignificant. And, you know, we, we talked to Stanford economist Nick Bloom, who said that there are major shifts happening in worker preferences. So one of the things that you have to ask yourself, if customers' patterns, whether it's at work or other patterns, are changing, can it have an effect on the online buying patterns? And I say yes. And we have some of our own data that we're going to share in a little bit to show that it does change. So if customers are now also changing what they normally do on a given day that affects what I'm going to buy, um, based on what Professor Bloom had told us, people are, are doing less of their like regular daily personal care or hygiene. They're showering less. And they have to save time on on the shower they would have taken. They are shaving less. So they're, they're saving time on the, the shave. That, and all of this can add up to about 70 extra minutes, seven zero. <laughs> it's a big amount of time. So now, Dave, the question I ask you, if you're one of these workers that gets to work home, whether it's two a days a week, three days a week, or even fully virtual, wouldn't you think that since my pattern has changed regarding work, that that would also impact other parts of my life in oh. what I'm going to do, in my experiences, in my shopping behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I used to buy a few pairs of shoes every couple of years because I'm using them all the time. Same thing with my pants and my shirts and, you know, my, my, dress, my dress clothes, my work clothes. I haven't had to update anything because I, I really haven't gotten a lot of miles out of the clothes. I, I'm not, I haven't left, I haven't walked as many miles in, in my shoes. My clothing is lasting longer because really I'm wearing track my, my, my workout clothes, my sweats, my, my athletic wear, my casual stuff is kind of what I live in. You know, if I'm going to be on camera, I might throw something on, what do they call that? Waist up attire. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, if you saw the sneakers that I have that usually, or so sorry, if you saw, if you saw the shoes that I had that I have right now, you would be shocked if I told you that I've had them for six years. I haven't had to, I haven't had to wear them all that much. So yeah, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not without that normal wear and tear, it's going to last longer. So you won't need to spend your money on it to replace it. Right. And so I, I, I recall a conversation I had with, um, what I believe it was Tim Ash had told us that, you know, to create change, you only need about 20%, 20% of people to create change. If you're talking about an organization and, um, other things, 20% seems to be the, the, the mark where it then starts making an impact. Hmm. And, we're over that margin, uh, over the 20% when it talk, when we're talking about people working from home. And just like you said, Dave, you know, you think about behaviors changing, you know, again, we, if we were to cite Nick Bloom's research from Stanford, he talks about leisure activities increasing, golfing and gyms. He said gyms were, were about to be gone, right? Yep. And, they, and so golf courses, and now it's reversed. People. We, a lot more people used to live in cities. People moved out. Some of those people have been recalled with return to office mandate, but a lot of people moved around, changed their lifestyle, changed their priorities. Travel right now to foreign countries is as high as it's been since the pandemic. Uh, so people have shifted their dollars. It's a shift of dollars. Maybe I, I did buy an extra a tie and 
you know, or if, if, if I'm, I'm wearing some heels and I'm buying some extra heels because, you know, the other one's broke from going to meetings and conferences, that's not happening nearly as much. And one of the things that we had on one of our previous episodes is those signals. The signals being ignored can over time lead to really big problems. So one week, eh, oh, a little, little lower. Okay, fine. Next week, third week, if, if that isn't being watched, when, especially when it comes to inventory, big problems can happen. You know, and in, in the case of the pandemic, post-pandemic, inventory and logistics are all a mess. All of them are a mess. <laughs> and if you don't have it down cold, or if you're not having real tight systems to manage this, because all of a sudden consumer preferences start changing, the inventory that took you know, nine months to bring in is going to sit there for a lot longer and tie up a lot of cash. So now during the pandemic, Dave, because we're talking about a shift, you know, things started opening up. People started shopping again. Stores, they went from being closed a lot to opening uh, and having hours where, um, you know, early hours for seniors, you know, the, the, the vulnerable folks could go shop and, and more and more, uh, places started doing pickup curbside pickup, um, same day pickup. And as, as things started opening up to my surprise, Dave, I, I, you know, we're, we, we sell tons of stuff online, but to my surprise, and, and I, I think, uh, Professor Bloom kind of planted the bug in, in our heads a couple of weeks ago when he came on. He said, big enterprises doubled their profits when you look at 2022 compared to 2020. And we checked it out and it checks out, Dave. I would call it the comeback of retail, <laughs> especially for these three companies that we looked at in this case study. You know, I, I, I've done some shopping recently. And was blown away that it was hard to find parking. There were lines. There was a buzz in the air. P you know, um, th there was product on the shelf. And yeah. here we're seeing that sales are up. I I'm, I'm impressed that, yeah. the, that the consumers still are attracted to retail stores. Go right. Going out and making purchases. You know, I don't know if it's because... FedEx can't deliver a package anymore. I don't know if it's because delays with Amazon or where the delays are, are coming, but I'll tell you, going into a store, touching something, holding it, buying it, you leave with it. That's that satisfaction all immediate all Immediate gratification. Immediate. It's an immediate gratification. And I think retailers, the, the good ones, right? This is not happening across the board, but the ones that were strong prior to the pandemic and they were growing like TJ Maxx, like Walmart, like Marshall's and Ross Dress for Less. And the reason we're highlighting those four is that those four have an overlap with the Zoo Lily customer in some mm. cases, it's particularly the off price retailers. Um, and so if you're a budget conscious female and you were shopping on Zoo Lily, and you have a lot of overlap in the inventory that Zulily had. And now, you know what? Things open up. And sometimes it's horrible timing for some companies. It's all about the timing, right? These companies, you know, in 2020, 2021, they saw, they saw a temporary pullback. And so they're thinking, how do we bring them back? What do we need to do? The consumer doesn't, you know, like you're saying, it's top up or what is it? Uh, from, from the waist up. From the waist up, <laughs> right. you know, there's still people zooming and doing all of that on camera. So that's still had driving some sales. And we're showing here a graphic of, of TJ Maxx's sales and that their profits doubled. And I know we have, we have those numbers. Well, let me tell you a little bit about those numbers uh, because they are uh, amazing. TJ Maxx. After a slight dip in 2020, TJ Maxx saw its revenue return to pre-pandemic levels by 2021. And they have steadily reached $16.3 billion in 2023 with their fiscal year ending June 30th. 
Now, get this. The important part is not the top line number. That gives you, that's just like a therm thermostat. It's telling us more or less what's happening. But what you want to know is how much money they put in the bank as a result of all those sales. And here it is. In 2020, mm -hmm. they generated net income of $434 million. That's about $100 million every quarter. Amazing. This amazing. But in 2020, 2023, 2023, can I say that? 2023, they generated income of $808 million, Dave. Doubled. Almost doubled. And that's exactly what Professor Nick Bloom told us. But it doesn't end there. That was just TJ Maxx. You think, okay, that's just one blip. But we found that to be the case with a few others as well. Man, doubled their revenue. Sorry, yeah, doubled their, their profits. Net their profits in two years. Yeah. That's amazing. So they figured out, they figured out, hey, uh, real quickly, we got to find a way to survive, right? The pandemic shut us down. We got to find a way to survive. People are not going to be wearing as many ties. People are not going to be, you know, buying wing tape shoes and all the other stuff that comes with normal office wear, right? And other things and other preferences that, that they sold, home goods, all the rest. So your inventory mix has got to reflect that change. What you have, got to get rid of some of that stuff. You got to bring in what the customer wants. And not only that, Dave, but then they go in and start doing some of the Amazon-like things about pickup and returns and improving their processes. The customer experience now gets way better than, you know what, that Zulily, they keep messing up my order or it gets canceled. Or it gets delayed. I'm not doing that anymore, right? It doesn't take long for customers to bail on you when you have that kind of experience. So now the question remains, is what we're seeing in retail places like TJ Maxx, is this sustainable growth that we've seen for the past two years? Or is this a swell? Mm, interesting question, Dave. I think we, before we answer that question, we have to look at what's happening in the retail space as a whole, especially in these off retail brands. And we've got two others that we want to highlight before we answer that question. So hold that question. Let's go back to it. All right. Marshalls, another competitor to Zulily. There's some overlap with the budget conscious. Marshalls, I've found good deals myself going to Marshalls. Um, I've gotten stuff. That's, you know, they, they love selling stuff that's uh, liquidated merchandise from the uh, retailers or high, high brands. Those are uh, luxury brands that are uh, selling goods at Marshall's. But check this out. Let's look at the numbers. So here's what the numbers say about Marshall's. Marshall's revenue jumped back in 2021 and climbed the top line numbers, jumped to 11.4 billion in uh, reaching, I'm sorry, reaching 11.4 billion in 2023. Here's, but that, again, ignore that part. This is just the top line number. Here's the profits, the what matters to the investors, what matters to the shareholders, what matters to management. Net income or profits. Witness the rebound. They went from 246 million in 2020 to a whopping 500 million in 2023, in year, fiscal year 2023. Dave, again, doubled the profits. It's exactly what Professor Bloob told us. And the, that's exactly what's playing out here with Marshalls. Let's round it out with the anchor leg of all, all the mother, I would, I guess some people would call it the mother of all off-brand retailers, Ross Dress for Less. They experienced in 2020, a temporary, they would call it now a temporary decline in, ev in revenue and returned to a pre-pandemic trajectory in 2021 and still since 2021 has maintained a consistent growth in their numbers. Where in 2023, their top line number was $14.9 billion in sales. Again, Let's look at the bottom line, what they kept in the bank, the profits. The, their net profits saw a steady recovery, recovery going from $378 million in 2020 
to 600 million in 2023. So again, they almost doubled. Again, following the pattern that uh, economist Nick Bloom had mentioned uh, during the time. And so to me, there's a clear pattern right now. They've been steadily growing their profit, their bottom line, uh, usually a good sign of management as well. And if they're able to keep their finger, this is what I would say, getting back to your question about, is this sustainable? They've doubled their profits in two years, three years, right? 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. So three years, they're doubled their profits. You know, if they grew 80% in one year, which is what happened at Logitech, that's unsustainable, right? Because it, it, you need a lot of stuff to meet the demand when 80% growth is what you experience. And so a lot of companies that were in the tech space, that were in the hardware space, uh, and others that delivered goods into homes and into people's um, lives to make it better during the pandemic, saw a huge drop off because now I can go back to Italy. I want to go to Rome, Dave. I want to go experience something in <laughs> France. I want to, I want to travel. You know, a lot of RVs took off. RV sales took off during the pandemic. Now a nice glide down. The patterns change. So having the finger on the pulse of the customer, whether they're buying RVs, whether they're buying cameras, or now flying to Monaco or France or Brazil or wherever, that's going to have an implication on other things, a ripple effect. And really good companies are paying attention to those signals. And the signals sometimes are just hidden because you really think, oh, that, that's not going to affect me. But hold on there because you can end up uh -oh. in a real bad situation when one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, which is what we've found in the case of Zazili. One thing leads to another, their competition was doing better, offline retailers are improving their game. And now if the experience with your customer is poor, which seems to be the case as well, things are gonna go bad. Well, I'd be interested to take these three companies and kind of see what they were doing pre-pandemic. It's my feeling that it's my feeling that there has been a shift where folks want to go to a retail environment, but this it, we don't have enough information here to really to, to really gauge that. If it's my opinion, um, well, you could yeah. Go well, on. it's you know I'm 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 think I'm considering that if if for TJ Maxx, for example, if they were able to double their net earnings in two years. Yeah. What were they doing prior to the pandemic? Because if it, if it's f still flat, is that a, is that a major win, but we don't have the numbers to compare it. Well, you think about retailers that have been in business, you know, some, one of the key indicators is that uh, really good organizations are able to learn from failures. You know, we, mm -hmm. I've heard that recently from several, several guests watching other podcasts that have other um, experts on it. Learning for failures is key. You know, we learn for us, just internalize it to our own experience, uh, both pre and post pandemic is that you're going to have to make pivots, sometimes several pivots, you know, for us, we had to change the way we got inventory, the way the inventory went out, the types of products customer want, uh, the customer wants. And today, that has changed as well, simply because the customer needs are different than they were two years ago, three years ago, even five years ago. So meeting that customer demand is, it can be very elusive uh, because data can have a lag on it, um, in weeks, sometimes months, but having a good, um, a strong connection to both the customer as well as the data to back up, you know, the hunch or, or decision is where companies tend to excel. Um, you know, there's a lot of company, there's a lot of data out there today on all sorts of things. And I would imagine that those companies that 
as part of their DNA, as part of their culture, look back and reevaluate what's happening rather than saying, hey, you know, it's all good. We don't need to change. We, we, we got the best widget in the world. I mean, we had the president of BlackBerry, a former president of BlackBerry that was on. I mean, and that, that whole business has changed, right? BlackBerry was great. They are no more. Compaq was great. They are no more. Uh, digital was great. They are no more. Uh, and so you're only as good as your, 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 your desire to keep up with change. I would, I would say for us in the IT business, that's especially true because of the rapid change, rapid innovation. Things are changing. AI, who knows what's going to come down the line with AI that's moving so fast, but the ability to say, Hey, look, we don't have all the answers today, but we know things are changing and we always have to go back and reevaluate. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What's working? What's not working? And be willing to say, you know what? We failed at that, but we're going to make the next version better is something of, I think, a mindset. And some people don't want to admit they've made bad decisions or wrong decisions or failed, which doesn't always need to be a bad thing. I've heard what Stephen Bartlett say, he failed 70 times and the ability to learn from those failures and say, okay, I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to run this experiment instead of that experiment. And to keep that going is what allows you to then come up with, this is exactly what the customer wants. This is exactly what they want to hear. This is the exact product we should be building because we tried four versions that didn't work. And, and, and we learned from those four, this is what we're going to put on version five. Right. right. So I think that that has to be part of the culture is to constantly be learning, constantly improving. You know, I think about my experience with some of the brands I've worked for and every few years, there was always some massive changes. We, we had to change our strategy and our playbook. You had to evolve with the marketplace. You had to evolve with your customers. That's kind of our, our lead in with, with the technologies or the solutions that we offer. We want to help companies evolve their technology to meet the changing customer demand. I'm not trying to put a um, a commercial in the middle of this, mm -hmm. but this is this is sort of our mantra. We have access to new technology that can help the small to medium businesses upgrade their technology. You have to evolve your strategy. Your playbook is changing. Your customers are changing. You need to up your technology to meet those customer demands or else you're risking the um you're risking your business so uh, i didn't want to i wasn't trying to throw that in there i wasn't trying to be corny about it but change is good if your business isn't changing their playbook maybe you're in a market that's not changing but how can it but how can it not be unless you're a boot, boutique seller of something special and you know where your clients are, but uh, you know not not paying attention to where they are or how you're going to change the way that you grow sales or meet customer demand, whatever it might be. You're you're not you're doing a a disservice by by not paying attention to that. And so much is changing, and so much will continue to change. I hope that the retail environment. I'll tell you, nothing is more depressing than driving through a town and seeing seeing a uh, the mini malls. What, what were those called? The stretch, I don't even know the names the of strip the, malls. Yeah, the strip malls. Seeing a strip mall that's just vacant is a very depressing sign. Seeing a huge mall with a vacant parking lot or just 10% of the parking lot being used, that's a that's an ugly bad sign. When I drove by my mini, mini mall and our Full size mall uh, this past weekend, both were packed, and I don't know why. It just makes me feel good. It's nice to know that people are still out there spending money. It doesn't have to be online, but it's nice that they're that they're out there buying things and that they're not afraid to still use their money or get in their car and get out there and you know to do it. Not everything can be a virtual business. Um, Maybe it's part of your strategy, but the customers, what, what I'm seeing from just this past week from to, compared to a couple of years ago, I feel just from my own eyeballs, 
that more customers are out in retail. So for me, I, I like that idea. Um, we're, our products that we're selling, we're not going to be in retail anyways. So we're selling more <laughs> business to business type solutions. So it's not an indicator for our business. It's an indicator that people are perhaps tired of waiting for a delivery truck to get an item that doesn't fit that they're going to return anyways. So, well, to to speak to that, Dave, I know we were we were going to share some actual numbers around golden hours. Now, what is golden hours? So if you're selling online, here's some insight. If you can determine when your customer is shopping or the bulk of your orders are coming in online and you can target them better through ads on like for us, Amazon is a, is a one, one, one channel. It's a very big channel for us. And if we can know when the consumer is going to be online shopping, we can target them much better than if we just spray the ads from midnight to 11.59 p.m. Because those consumers doesn't shop that way. Uh, they don't shop at all hours all the time. Although shopping is occurring through the entire day, when we look at our data, there is a concentration of that. So now if I can find patterns in that data, I can better allocate my budget. I can better allocate my time or resources in targeting those customers. So we look back at thousands, tens of thousands of our own orders when it comes to online. And here's what we found. We found that in 2022, there was a golden hours for our products. Now we are in the office space. A lot of our products are used in IT, our IT products used you know, for folks that are sitting at a desk or road warriors and that kind of thing. And we found that, for example, Wednesdays, golden hours for shopping were 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., which means that I got a long stretch of about 12 hours where a good chunk of orders tended to come in. Fridays, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So there's some shifts just within those two days for those golden hours. But get this, in 2023, well, we found this on Wednesdays that shifted from that 12 hour window to 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So the window shrunk where the bulk of the orders were coming in. Same pattern on Friday. Fridays in 2023, we found that 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. were golden hours, where again, bulk of the orders tended to come in. So the shifts in the buying patterns so that if more people are doing that, what we also find that supports the patterns of hybrid and remote work days when people are in the office versus at home. Um, and this pattern and, and the golden hours is also uh, magnified when you look at summer versus winter. We found that on Fridays, the golden hours, instead of the 3 p.m. mark, uh, that I mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, 6 p.m. during 2022, that we would see that even at around 2 p.m., a massive on Friday, around 2 p.m. Friday during the summer, there's a massive drop off in orders. And we found this over and over again throughout different product lines. So Fridays are not friends, <laughs> Fridays are not a friend of the employee to go into work. And they're not always a friend for folks that are selling products like us. So why would you waste money when they're not at their computer? They're not on their mobile phone shopping. It'd be a total waste of your ad spend, ad dollars, marketing budget. If they're like a lot of our customers on, during those hours, whether they're on their phone, mobile phone shopping, or they're on their computer doing the buying, you want to target them when they're there. And what we've found is a better ROI when we're doing that. And that's what we wanted to share with you that take a look at your um, marketing, advertising budgets. If you're, if you're doing that with digital ads, you will find a pattern. It may not match ours, but I guarantee you whether you're marketing um, something to the consumer or you're marketing to a business buyer, you will find a pattern and patterns are hard to break unless something major like what happened with COVID 
and what happened with after the pandemic. Those patterns don't change. People get up in the morning, they log into work, they start working now more than ever on their, on their laptops at home. And those patterns tend to repeat themselves over and over and over and over again. Finding those patterns can make you a lot of money. So I encourage you to find those patterns, those patterns right now. If you go check out those patterns, I guarantee you the data will validate what your hunch. And somebody said this to me recently. You instinctively know that whether you're in a big business or in a small business, this is when this action is occurring. You may just need the, val the, the validation from the data, and I guarantee you, you're going to find it if you look in your data, especially if you're, shop if you're selling online today. Dave, did I miss anything else, or you, do you want to add something about executing and targeting customers during golden hour? You know, I'm glad that you analyze this because there's a lot of money that's being spent on ads. Understanding your golden hours when I'm, said, I'm glad I said hours. Um, <laughs> analyzing when that's hot is obviously important to keep your operational expenses in line. I'm very interested to see what happens when we take a deep dive in 2023 to kind of look at those trends and, of course, have our ear to the ground for 2024 trends coming up. I, I am. And so, I can't say any more there, uh, Dave, because I think we've said it all today. But if you've been hanging out here, we want to tell you we have appreciated your support in 2023 and are looking forward to an unbelievable 2024 with you. If you want to support us, go ahead, hit that like and subscribe. We don't normally say that, but go ahead and do that. It not only shows your support, but helps us bring this program to you as uh, more people will get to see it when you hit the subscribe, as well as hitting the like button on whatever platform you're on. So we really appreciated your support in 2023. And if you want to nerd out on more of these failures, Dave, because you learn by other people's mistakes, because I don't want to make other people's mistakes. And if I can grab a couple of nuggets out of there and put it into play in our business, that's what I want to do. So go ahead and check out some of these big business failures when it comes to the missteps made by Compaq, Sunbeam, and Sports Authority. We cover those in previous episodes with actual tangible, executable things that you could do so that you can avoid some of those same mistakes. Dave and I will see you in those episodes. Now, for those that are on YouTube, Dave, as well as me, will provide you more value on how you can grow your business faster with the videos we've got up here. <laughs> Dave and me, we'll see you in those videos.